Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1155 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Updated radio frequency exposure rules for radio amateurs become effective on May 3rd. We will have all the details on what you have to file with the Commission. The FCC is encouraging the public to use its new speed test application to measure your broadband speed. It appears that SpaceX is a little perturbed with radio amateurs, so it's now encrypting its spacecraft communications. We will tell you why. The Intrepid DX Group joins forces with LA7GIA in its upcoming attempt to activate Beauvais Island. The Radio Amateurs of Canada announced its Get on the Air World Amateur Radio event. The University of Alaska at Fairbanks receives a $9.3 million grant in support of HARP and to create a national atmospheric research facility. And the BBC in the UK continues shutting down its medium wave broadcast transmitters in favor of digital. We'll have the story. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the current chip shortages we are experiencing and why Apple messaging has never been ported to the Android platform. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, will talk about the dynamic nature of your shack. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at what amateur radio life was like during the 1930s. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about how you can make tower hardware from scraps you have hanging around your yard. And that's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, this Week in Amateur Radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, and sitting in for the vacationing Will Rogers, K5WLR, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from along the southern shore of Lake Ontario in Rochester, New York, where April showers arrived earlier this week and have decided to stay for a while, I'm Dave Wilson. WA2HOY. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, where it doesn't look very much like spring, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the snow just won't seem to stop this year, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And now, with this week's lead story, here's Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. The Federal Communications Commission has announced that rule changes detailed in a lengthy 2019 report and order governing RF exposure standards go into effect on May 3, 2021. With more on these modified requirements for amateurs, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME files this report. The new rules don't change existing RF exposure or RFE limits, but do require that stations be evaluated against existing limits unless exempt. For stations already in place, that evaluation must be completed by May 3, 2023. After May 3rd of this year, any new station or any existing station modified in a way that's likely to change its RFE profile, such as different antennas or placement or greater power, will need to conduct an evaluation by the date of activation or change. The FCC anticipates that few hams would have to reevaluate their stations under the new rules. The amateur service is no longer categorically excluded from certain aspects of the rules as amended, and licensees can no longer avoid performing an exposure assessment simply because they're transmitting below a given power level. The 2019 FCC RF report and order changes the methods that many radio services use to comply with FCC RFE limits. 
HAMS will have to determine whether any existing facilities excluded under the old rules now qualify for an exemption under the new rules. Most will, but some may not. Removal of the categorical exclusion means that HAMS must perform some sort of calculation, either to determine if they qualify for an exemption or have to perform a full-fledged exposure assessment. ARRL has help at www.arrl.org forward slash RF hyphen exposure. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In the RF report and order, the Commission anticipated that few parties would have to conduct re-evaluations under the new rules and that such evaluations will be relatively straightforward, the FCC said in an April 2nd public notice. It nevertheless adopted a two-year period for parties to verify and ensure compliance under the new rules. For most amateurs, the major difference is the removal of the categorical exclusion for amateur radio, which means that ham station owners must determine if they either qualify for an exemption or must perform a routine environmental evaluation, said Greg Lapin, N9GL, chair of the AWRL RF Safety Committee and a member of the FCC Technological Advisory Council. Ham stations previously excluded from performing environmental evaluations will have until May 3, 2023 to perform these. After May 3, 2021, any new stations or those modified in a way that affects RF exposure must comply before being put into service, Lapin said. The FCC also modified the process for determining whether a particular device or deployment is exempt from a more thorough analysis by replacing a service-specific list of transmitters, facilities, and operations for which evaluation is required with new streamlined formula-based criteria. The report and order also addressed how to perform evaluations where the exemption does not apply and how to mitigate exposure. Amateur radio licensees will have to determine whether any existing facilities previously excluded under the old rules now qualify for an exemption under the new rules. Most will, but some may not. For amateurs, the major difference is the removal of the categorical exclusion, Lapin said, which means that every ham will be required to perform some sort of calculation either to determine if they qualify for an exemption or must perform a full-fledged exposure assessment. For hams who previously performed exposure assessments on their stations, there is nothing more to do. The ARRL laboratory staff is available to help amateurs to make these determinations and, if needed, perform the necessary calculations to ensure their stations comply. ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, who helped prepare ARRL's RF Exposure and U book, explained it this way. The FCC did not change any of the underlying rules applicable to amateur station evaluations, he said. The sections of the book on how to perform routine station evaluations are still valid and usable, especially the many charts of common antennas at different heights. Hare said ARRL lab staff also would be available to help amateurs understand the rules and evaluate their stations. RF Exposure and You is available for free download from ARRL. ARRL also has an RF safety page on its website. The ARRL RF Safety Committee is working with the FCC to update the FCC aids for following human exposure rules. OET Bulletin 65 and OET Bulletin 65 Supplement B for radio amateurs. In addition, ARRL is developing tools that all hams can use to perform exposure assessments. As part of the FCC's broadband data collection effort to collect comprehensive data on broadband availability across the United States, the Federal Communications Commission is encouraging the public to download the FCC's Speed Test application, 
which is currently used to collect speed test data as part of the FCC's Measuring Broadband America program. The app provides an easy way for consumers to test the performance of their mobile and in-home broadband networks. In addition to showing network performance test results to the user, the app provides the test results to the FCC while protecting the privacy and confidentiality of program volunteers. To close the gap between digital haves and have-nots, we are working to build a comprehensive, user-friendly dataset on broadband availability. Expanding the base of consumers who use the FCC's speed test app will enable us to provide improved coverage information to the public and to add to the measurement tools we're developing to show where broadband is truly available throughout the United States, said Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. The network coverage and performance information gathered from the speed test data will help to inform the FCC's efforts to collect more accurate and granular broadband deployment data. The network coverage and performance information gathered from the speed test data will help to inform the FCC's efforts to collect more accurate and granular broadband deployment data. The app will also be used in the future for consumers to challenge provider-submitted maps when the broadband data collection systems become available. You can test the performance of your mobile and in-home broadband networks by downloading the FCC's speed test application on your mobile devices. In addition to showing your network performance test results, the app also provides the test results back to the FCC as part of their Measuring Broadband America program. The program gathers crowdsourced data on broadband network performance across the United States. The information collected through the app will help to inform the FCC's efforts to provide improved coverage information to the public. We expect that some of the information collected through the app will be incorporated into the Commission's broadband data collection systems, including challenges to provider submitted maps and our collection of additional crowdsourced data. As these new capabilities become available, app users may be asked to update or reinstall a new version of the app and to provide additional information and consents that will allow us to collect more precise speed test and location data for potential users in developing our public maps. The FCC Speed Test app is available in the Google Play Store for Android devices and in the Apple App Store for iOS devices. Search FCC Speed Test in either store to find and download the app. More information about the app is available on the FCC website. SpaceX doesn't operate like a traditional aerospace company. For one, the CEO is usually hamming it up on Twitter during launches and providing details that would usually go into a press release. SpaceX also live streams almost all of its launches, even the prototypes that have an unfortunate tendency to blow up lately. It wasn't even encrypting the Falcon 9 telemetry feed until now. Unfortunately, some digging by amateur radio tinkerers seem to have convinced SpaceX to step up its security. It all started a few weeks ago when several Redditors managed to lock onto the 2232.5 MHz telemetry downlink from a Falcon 9 upper stage. Right away, they were able to pull out a few interesting plain text snippets from the unencrypted feed. With a little more work, the radio enthusiasts were able to capture some amazing images from the spacecraft's cameras. After that discovery went public, other SpaceX fans tried to grab some data from the Starship during its prototype test. However, SpaceX had chosen to encrypt that data. Even with the right wireless equipment, the decoded signal was just noise. And now it appears the same thing is happening with the Falcon 9. When attempting to pull data from the most recent Falcon 9 launch, the original signal snoopers discovered it also had been encrypted. A series of tweets from SpaceX engineers suggests the decoding of the telemetry signal was the reason for the change. Naturally, the amateur radio community was upset about the move. The general feeling among these groups is that SpaceX didn't need to encrypt the signal because they weren't doing anything wrong. This is true, but even the original decoders had to admit it could be bad actors who intended to misuse the rocket's telemetry. I'd wager someone at SpaceX panicked about the possibility of sensitive proprietary data could leak out through its feed. SpaceX has national security contracts as well. And the government most likely wouldn't appreciate seeing its secret assets on a decoded telemetry feed. There's a growing sentiment among amateur radio operators that the new generation of spacecraft and satellites will be off-limits to civilians. 
Many of those in, involved in analyzing the telemetry signal have expressed disappointment that SpaceX would lock them out, but this could be a par for the course going forward. The Intrepid DX Group has teamed with DXpeditioner Ken Opscar, LA7GIA, in its quest to activate Bouvet Island, the second most wanted DXCC entity, according to Club Log. With more on this story, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. The 3Y0J expedition is planned for January-February 2023. A dependency of Norway, Bouvet is a sub-Antarctic island in the South Atlantic. The last Bouvet activation was 3Y0E during a scientific expedition over the winter of 2007-2008. D-Expedition co-leader Paul Ewing, N6PSE, will share leadership duties with OpsGAR. There's no question there's a lot to do, um, and we've got a big financial mountain to climb. The cost of the Braveheart Charter is enormous, but uh, you know we've got some experience uh, under our belt doing these. We did South Sandwich, South Georgia back in 2016. That was perfect preparation for going to Bouvet. We'll have a very difficult landing, so we're prepared for that. A 2018 de-expedition to Bouvet was scuttled after severe weather and an engine problem forced the team, with Bouvet already in view, to turn back. The 2023 plan calls for the 3Y0J team of 14 to spend 20 days at Bouvet and, weather permitting, to have 14 to 16 good days of radioactivity. This costs money, of course, and the Northern California DX Foundation and the International DX Association have already stepped up to the plate. But I want to make it clear, there's no doubt, we are going. This will be an arduous and expensive mission. Our budget is $764,000, and the 3YOJ team will fund much of this mission. We desperately need the global DX community to support our mission and help us make this important activation of the second most wanted DXCC entity. It is only through this kind of support that we can achieve our mission of making 100,000 contacts or more from Bouvet. We plan to make the best use of propagation and modes on 10 through 160 meters, Ewing said in the announcement. Operation will be on single sideband, CW, and digital modes. We pledge to assemble the strongest team possible and to use good operating practices to optimize your ability to reach our stations. We are confident that the Braveheart crew can get us there and back safely. Follow the Intrepid DX Group's 3YOJ plans via Facebook. Visit the 3YOJ website for more information and to make a donation. The Rebel DX Group has announced that its 3YOI D expedition is still on for later this year, with a team of eight spending up to 30 days on Bouvet Island. Donald DeRig, JA8CD, on the Caribbean island of St. Vincent, says that on April 13th, the 42nd anniversary of the 1979 eruption of the La Soufriere volcano, island residents were awakened to another column of volcanic ash, creating a thick blanket, obscuring part of the eastern sky as the volcano continues to erupt violently. Almost all residents in the red zone have been evacuated, save for a few diehards who will not move for reasons unknown, he said. Since the effusive eruption began last December, local hams have been in a state of readiness via two-meter networks and other regional networks via HF. A 24-hour regional HF network and vigil has been active since the violent eruptions began eight days ago to provide communication support should telephone service be disrupted by the volcanic hazard. This includes a twice daily link up on HF with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. There is also a two-meter gateway via Echolink on the JA8AZ node. The other active VHF repeater is the main resource for domestic communications. The Granada repeater, which is linked to St. Lucia and Barbados, is also accessible by hams in Tobago, Trinidad, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines. The La Soufriere volcano on St. Vincent began a series of explosive eruptions on April 9th, sending clouds of hot ash some 20,000 feet into the air, blanketing much of the island in ash and causing water and powder outages. The volcano is a constant threat, according to the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. Ten more local BBC radio stations are turning off their medium wave transmitters for good this year. 
BBC Essex, Cambridgeshire, Devon, Leeds, Sheffield, Hereford and Worcester, Stoke, Lancashire, Ulster and BBC Radio Foil will go to FM and digital only in May and June 2021. In addition, BBC Radio Wales and BBC Radio Gloucestershire will reduce their AM coverage. The BBC's intention to close medium wave transmitters was first announced 10 years ago in 2011. In 2018, the corporation commenced with these plans and continued them in 2020 across Scotland, Wales and England. Kieran Clifton, the director of BBC Distribution and Business Development, said that a large and increasing share of radio listening in the UK, including to the BBC, is digital, and the BBC is committed to a digital future for radio. In recent years, we've made significant investment in local DAB expansion, he said. All of our local radio stations are available on digital terrestrial TV, such as Freeview, and we've transformed our online and mobile offering with the app BBC Sounds. The Radio Amateurs of Canada has announced the Get on the Air on World Amateur Radio Day operating event. World Amateur Radio Day is observed each year on April 18th to celebrate the formation of the International Amateur Radio Union on April 18, 1925. The object of the event is to contact as many RAC suffix stations as possible. RAC official stations will operate across Canada from 0000 until 2359 UTC on April 18th. The RAC official station call signs are VA2RAC, VA3RAC, VE1RAC, VE4RAC, VE5RAC, VE6RAC. VE7RAC, VE8RAC, VE9RAC, VO1RAC, VO2RAC, VY0RAC, VY1RAC, and VY2RAC. Stations contacting one or more of these stations will be eligible for a commemorative certificate. No logs are needed. From 0000 to 0500 UTC and again from 1200 to 1800 UTC, VA3RAC will be active in the Ontario QSO party, sending the contest exchange. Stations contacting VA3RAC during those times are encouraged to send their contest exchange in return, which is state, province, country, or Ontario County. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System Newsletter reports that in March, the ubiquitous over-the-horizon radars, known as OTHRs, made up about 60% of all interference observations. One cannot even count them anymore, their monthly report says. The report also suggests that presumably there are only a few stations transmitting on often changing frequencies. In contrast to the past, there are more and more burst systems, which usually transmit for only a few seconds and then the frequency is changed. Only the over-the-horizon radars Container from Russia and Pluto from the UK base in Cyprus each transmit on a frequency for a longer period of time. The IARU Monitoring System Region 1 March 2021 newsletter is produced by the organization's coordinator, Gaspar, Echo Alpha 6, Alpha Mike Mike. It's in PDF form, and you can read it at www.iaru-r1.org, and the latest newsletter is linked from the front page. The monitoring system's own web pages, www.iarums-r1.org, have a lot more information and also tells you how to report intruding signals of all types. Here is the Volunteer Monitor Report for March 2021. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the March 2021 Volunteer Monitor Program Report. The FCC delayed action on the renewal application of a general class licensee in Quakertown, Pennsylvania, in order to review allegations of repeated transmission of obscenities and failure to properly identify. 
The Volunteer Monitor Coordinator issued 14 advisory notices. An advisory notice is an attempt to resolve rule violation issues informally before FCC intervention. An advisory notice was sent to the owner of a remote amateur station in California, advising him that he is responsible for deliberate interference transmitted by any station over his remote facility. An advisory notice was sent to a radio amateur in Ripley, Tennessee, regarding deliberate interference and failure to properly identify on 75 meters. An advisory notice was sent to a radio amateur in Jefferson, Georgia, concerning failure to properly identify on 40 meters. Advisory notices were sent to radio amateurs in Tiburon, Petaluma, and Manteca, California, and Grants Pass, Oregon, concerning interference on 75 meters. General advisories were sent to operators in West Virginia, Michigan, Iowa, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Wisconsin concerning operation on 7.200, 3.927, and 3.860 MHz. A good operator commendation was sent to a husband and wife team in Periopolis, Pennsylvania, recognizing excellent net and two-meter operations. The staff of the Volunteer Monitoring Program had two meetings with FCC officials in March. As previously reported, Belgium's communications regulator, the BIPT, will resume amateur radio exams from April the 26th, provided that the evolution of coronavirus continues to show reduced levels of infection. The Belgian National Society, the UBA, says that in order to keep the risk of infection as low as possible, the exams will be taken in writing. Any calculations must be performed on paper and the use of a calculator is not allowed. The difficulty of the calculations to be performed will be adjusted accordingly. Candidates must bring the necessary writing material with them. The rest is made available by BIPT. Be sure to bring at least a spare ballpoint pen and a pencil. Because of the COVID measures, you're not allowed to use writing materials borrowed from another candidate. A face mask obligation applies throughout the examination building, including the examination rooms, and social distancing rules must be observed. A negative COVID certificate is not required. The invitation that the candidates receive from the regulator will contain the special guidelines on how the candidate must register and participate in the exam. And you can register for the exams by email to exam at bipt.be stating your full name, postal address, telephone number and a copy of both sides of your identity card in attachment. For the Class C exam, which is the basic permit, you must also provide your certificate showing that you've passed the practical test. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Wow, I was uh, stunned by this story. Router manufacturers, the big routers, the ones that internet service providers make and use, not make, they use, are now delayed, my, many ISPs are reporting, delayed as long as 60 weeks, more than a year, because of chip shortages. We are These chip shortages are rippling through the whole industry. You saw Ford has put off manufacture of, of F-150 trucks because they can't get the chips they're long uh, virtual lines to buy uh, some of the newer microprocessors, graphics processing cards, and chips for computers. ISPs who can't get these routers are uh, in a bind because they can't really expand. They can't add new subscribers. You need every you know, X subscribers, you need a new router. And they can't expand until they get new routers. One of the big manufacturers, a company uh, out of Taiwan called Zycel, since January, they've been asking customers to order products a year in advance because the lead time for, for these chips, components from companies like Broadcom, has doubled to a year or more as well. Wow. Supply chain problems. Now, what is the problem? Is it is it COVID? I guess some. Actually, <laughs> one of the problems for Zycel is, you remember that? That ship, the Ever Given, that got stuck in the Suez Canal? Well, one of the containers on there was full of Zycel routers. 
So those routers now are salvaged. The Egyptian government's claiming everything that's on board that shit. They're salvaged. I mean, I guess eventually <laughs> they'll get out there. Some of this is, you know, uh, COVID. Some of it is just high demand. You know, it's crazy. Silicon wafers that they use to make these chips are in short supply. So the components that they use to build the chips are in short supply. So that just ripples down. You know, the answer, of course, is going to take years, but companies like TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, that makes a lot of these chips. In fact, Apple has a deal with them to make all of its Apple Silicon M1 chips. Apple bought off all the stock, which actually caught a, caused a shortage among other non-Apple people buying chips from the same company. Nevertheless, these companies are saying, well, we're going to, yes, we're going to build new uh, factories, but they're, these factories are expensive. They cost... Uh, around $10 billion to build, and they take a couple of years. TSMC says we're going to invest $100 billion, $100 billion in making new factories over the next few years. Other ch chip manufacturers, Intel says we're going to build, to, uh, we're going to spend $30 billion. We're going to build three new fabs, at least two of them in Arizona, which is another good idea because, of course, there's a lot of concern about getting chips out of China with the geopolitical situation as it is. It's um, it's an interesting situation to be in. I guess, you know, in a way, this is a reflection of the success of the tech revolution. The demand for these things has gone through the roof. MacBook and iPad production delayed. Same thing because of chip shortages. It could be it could be all of this is up in the air again because they can't get the components. A shortage of displays, displays components, a shortage of processors not just processors it's, it's 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 little chips too there's a company that makes little tiny they call them dax this japanese company that makes these dax had a fire in uh, october actually but these dax are used in everything including those f-150 trucks and your phone and everything else this fire happened months ago but they're still um they're still rebuilding then there was another fire in march in tokyo in the Renesis Electronics Corporation, they make parts that uh, auto makers need, like Toyota, Nissan, and Honda, and, and Ford. Two thirds of uh, chips at the factory were automotive chips, and that factory's down for the count as of last month. So that's a couple of fires. The fire in October was at a, a factory that makes one sixth of the world's supply of, uh, of memory chips. SK Hynix, they had a fire in Shanghai. It just goes on and on. It's as if they don't want us to have technology. What's what's the story here? I, you know, I know that there's more in your life than chip shortages, but uh, it does impact everything. So if you see delays and stuff, like just things like signing up for an internet service provider, and they say, well, we can't, we, we, we don't have any routers to add you. Now you'll know. Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? So we now know, I mean, we always knew, but we now know for sure officially why Apple has never made its messages app for Android. I, I wish they would. I wish they would. What I'm really looking for, but now I guess I'm an unusual fella because I use both an Android phone and an iOS phone. Nobody does that. That's cuckoo. I just do it because I need to kind of keep up with both. So I have special needs. I want a, a messaging program I can use on both that can be the default on both. So when I get a text message on one, I can see it on the other and vice versa. That would be nice, but that's not going to happen. I think a lot of people who use Apple's messages want there to be an Android version because of other family members. You know, there's always pressure if you're an Android user uh, to get with the program and get an iPhone because you're a green bubble. And the green bubbles don't, <laughs> don't have equal, they don't have parity, you know? If uh, if somebody marks a message, ha ha, you see on the iPhone, you see a ha ha. On the Android phone, you see, you know, Leo said, ha ha. Oh, that's boring. Same thing. If I get balloons, you know, on, on, on messages whoosh, that blow up, oh, it's cool. On the Android phone, it just says Leo sent balloons or balloons showed up or something stupid. It's all text. <sighs> So you can text each other, but you, you, there's no, it's not the same. And Apple now, and we're finding this out because of the Apple Epic lawsuit. 
this is when this stuff always comes out. Because, you know, in lawsuits, you get to do something called discovery. I'm going to discover all your secrets. And in discovery, you know, they get they get things like emails and so forth. And then also, you can ask the other guys in for depositions. And uh, I guess during depositions, Apple executives said... Yeah, we thought about it. We worked on a version of uh, iMessage, our messages uh, program for Android. But then we decided against it. Why? Craig Federighi, senior vice president of software engineering, said, quote, iMessage on Android would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones. We don't want them to do that. Phil Schiller, director of marketing at the time, now an Apple fellow, in an email said the number one this is a quote. Most difficult reason to leave at the Apple universe is iMessage. iMessage amounts to serious lock-in. Moving to iMessage to Android will hurt us more than help us. <laughs> yeah, that's a smoking gun. I think that's a smoking gun. So you kn we knew that anyway. There's no technical reason. Apple admits it. We don't do it because we want to lock people in to iPhones and and particularly and this is really nefarious in a family where everybody's using iPhones we don't want them to give cheap $50 Android phones to the kids <laughs> we want them to buy the uh, the $400 uh, iPhone SE we uh, you know that's better for us maybe not better for the family <sighs> we always knew this but now we have proof it's too bad cuz this is and it's important to understand this is kind of for a lot of people this is when the scales fall from their eyes and they become wise to the ways of the world. The truth is out there. It turns out your interests as a human being do not necessarily match their interests as a company, as a corporation. And in fact, this is a perfect example because as human beings, as a society, it would make sense for everybody to use the same messaging platform. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that be awesome? And, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, the family says, we're going to, the hell with that, we're going to use WhatsApp. You know, but you can't, man, let's see, on an iPhone, you can't make WhatsApp the default messaging platform. You still, no matter what, on an iPhone, you have to use messages if you want to get text messages, period. There's no choice. Android, you can choose, not on an iPhone. So, uh, you know, Apple's got you. That's good for Apple. Make some more money keeps people from buying the other stuff but i would submit it's not so good for the rest of us for you know <laughs> society in general uh and apple you know let's face it you may love apple and, and i love apple I, you know i remember when i pressed my nose against the glass at the apple store and i saw that first lisa and i said boy that's a computer i'd want how much ten thousand dollars never mind then they came out with the mac 1984, pressed my nose against the glass in the window, said, how much? $2,500. Uh, I got a credit card. Bought it at Macy's. Paid for it for years. <laughs> but I got it. And at the time, you know, it was a computing for the rest of us. It was amazing. Apple fans, Mac, because it was just the Mac at the time, there wasn't a, you know, the Mac fans just, you know, were loyal. And that kind of kept going after the iPhone came out. The iPad, the iPod, let's not forget, people were loyal. People loved the company. But it's important. Reality sets in. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is in the world. I hate to be the person to ruin your innocence. But these companies, that's all they really care about. They don't care about you. You may love Apple. Apple doesn't love you. Apple loves your money. And they want to make as put as much of your money in their pockets as they possibly can. And it's not just Apple. It's everybody. Oh, they may pretend. <laughs> they may act. You know, Apple's great at that. The computer for the rest of us. Think different. You know, this is the intersection of, of arts and sciences. We're, we're better than anybody else. But, you know, they're just a company. And now we know the truth. <laughs> I hope that didn't, that didn't break your heart. It's hard, isn't it? the way of the world. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Cairo, Egypt. 
1938. In the pre-war time of colonial empires, this conjures up an image of Europeans in white linen suits, sitting on the veranda of a luxuriously decadent colonial hotel. Oppressive ceiling fans, dark, mysterious strangers, Peter Lorre, and Sidney Greenstreet. However, for amateurs, Cairo in 1938 meant a setback. The first international radio telegraph conference was held in Washington, D.C. in 1927. Although amateurs lost almost 40% of their allocations, the concept of amateur radio as a legal international hobby was established. The second conference was held in Madrid in 1932, and that produced no changes in ham radio. Now the third conference was at hand, but times had changed. Italy, Germany, and Spain were under fascist dictatorships. Stalin was directing a ruthless purge in the Soviet Union, and Japan was at war with China. The shortwaves were filled with propaganda broadcasts and military communications. Under this cloud of uncertainty, delegates from 71 countries assembled in Cairo on February 1st, 1938. How would amateur radio be treated under these circumstances? Actually, American hams came out of the battle with no major losses. Despite the number of dictatorships at the conference, there was no attempt to destroy amateur radio, which, after all, allowed individual citizens access to receivers and transmitters. The most serious threat came from Japan, which proposed that amateurs be limited to 50 watts input. The Japanese plan was easily defeated. The ARRL had pushed for expanded HF bands, but the American delegation, mindful of the potential hostility at the conference, did not propose it. The headlines in the July 1938 QST summed up Cairo. American amateurs retain all frequencies after a terrific fight. USA puts up splendid defense. European hams shortchanged by greedy governments. And European broadcasting to invade seven megacycle band in late 1939. In Europe, the 7200 to 7300 kilocycle segment of the 40 meter band would be shared with broadcasters starting September 1st, 1939. They also lost half of the 80 meter band to broadcasting and other services, and the European 5 meter band was scaled back to make way for television. However, it could have been a lot worse. The next international conference was set for Rome in 1942. It never took place. In other 1938 news, the amateur population was stabilized at 50,000 after years of growth. This was partly due to the increase in the code speed from 10 to 13 words per minute in 1937, with regenerative receivers and crystal control transmitters, which meant that two stations having a QSO would probably be on two separate frequencies. Many hams felt that 50,000 was the saturation point for our bands. On October 4, 1938, the FCC issued complete new amateur regulations. Included in the package were two new ham bands at 112 and 224 megacycles. What could hams do up there? Try amateur television. An all-electronic form of television was replacing the mechanical spinning disc, and QST carried several articles discussing the theory and construction of amateur TV stations. W6XAO was an experimental TV station in L.A., which would soon be followed by other pioneers, such as W2XBS. Where have I heard that call before? On September 2, 1938, the new Maxim Memorial Station, W1AW, was dedicated at 225 Main Street in Newington, Connecticut. The station was in memory of Hiram Percy Maxim, the founder and first president of the ARRL, who died in February 1936. Less than one month after Maxim's death, floods roared through the Connecticut River Valley and destroyed W1MK, which had been the league station. Later, in 1936, the ARRL Board of Directors allocated $18,000 to build a memorial station to honor W1AW, as well as to replace W1MK. 
The station would stand alone on Main Street in Newington until joined in 1963 by the ARRL QST offices, which moved from West Hartford. On September 13, 1938, Ross Howell, editor of QST, died after being electrocuted in his home. He had been working on a homebrew TV receiver. Ross was a native of Australia and held the call 3JU while living down under. He did not hold a U.S. license because the citizenship application was not finalized. Despite his lack of American amateur privileges, Ross Hull was instrumental in early VHF-UHF developments. He designed practical and inexpensive 5-meter stations and greatly contributed to the knowledge of VHF-UHF propagation. His death dramatically pointed out the dangers of working on live circuits, and for months thereafter, QST ran articles on how to switch to safety. No discussion of 1938 would be complete without including the Great Hurricane. In the fourth week of September, New England and Long Island, already soaked by previous rainstorms, were pounded by the unnamed hurricane, which was completely unexpected. Over 600 people died, and damage was $500 million in 1938 dollars. The new W1AW Memorial Station, just three weeks old, survived without any damage, although power was lost for 36 hours. Hundreds of amateurs grabbed whatever generators and batteries they could find and set up emergency stations on 5 meter AM and 160, 80, and 40 CW. Amateurs were the only source of communication for dozens of communities and handled everything from health and welfare traffic to police communications. It was a superb demonstration of public service at its best. In our next installment, we will look at amateur radio in World War II. Yes, amateurs were off the air, but what did they do if they weren't in uniform? What filled the pages of QST? And what was this WORS? Join me as the Ancient Amateur Archives Seeks the Truth. The University of Alaska at Fairbanks Geophysical Institute received a five-year, $9.3 million grant to expand activities at the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program in Gakona, Alaska, better known as HARP. The U.S. military built HARP in the 1990s for $290 million to conduct ionospheric research related to communications, navigation, surveillance, and more. But in 2015, the Air Force ended the program and turned HARP over to the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. UAF has operated it sporadically since, for government and independent clients, we've been charging a little over $5,000 an hour to use the facility, said UAF Geophysical Institute Director Bob McCoy. But we haven't had very many hours, so it's been costing us quite a bit. McCoy said the five-year, $9.3 million grant from the National Science Foundation will enable the university to maintain the HARP facility and expand its operations. Now we can open it up fully and invite in people to use it, so it's a really big deal for us, McCoy said. McCoy went on to say that the HARP station is the most powerful of the three ionospheric research facilities on the planet. It uses hundreds of high-frequency radio transmitters and antennas to probe the ionosphere, the layer of Earth's atmosphere that extends 50 to 600 miles above the surface. McCoy said it's a tool that will be increasingly valuable for scientific experiments evolving the aurora as the solar cycle peaks. The next four or five years, the ionosphere should get a lot more exciting, McCoy said. You should see, in the winter, a lot more dynamic aurora. HARP is also useful as a remote sensing tool, an application McCoy said is in demand as the Arctic warms and countries vie for control of it. We can actually look north several hundred miles from Alaska, and we can study the ocean, McCoy said. We can measure sea ice, and we can look for aircraft or ships out in the Arctic Ocean. HARP can transmit, say, to the north, reflect off the ionosphere down to the sea ice, and you pick up that signal again, either with an antenna or a satellite. McCoy said a separate grant will provide a million dollars to build and locate LIDAR instruments at the HARP site to study other parts of the upper atmosphere. That, together with other instrumentation UAF plans to relocate to the HARP site, will make up what's being called the Subaural Geophysical Observatory for Space Physics and Radio Science. 
foundations of amateur radio. If you have the opportunity to build your shack, it might start off as a table in the corner where you plonk down a radio, plug into nearby power and run coax to. That's pretty much how most shacks start, mine included. For me, the step of running coax was an activity that took weeks of planning and procrastination and days of climbing on the roof. After actually completing that and getting two runs of coax to my planned shack, one for HF and one for UHF and VHF, the shack building itself was pretty simple. I had to get power to the location, but an extension lead took care of that. In the interest of space, I put the power supply on the floor, a wooden floor that ensured good circulation, unlike carpet, perhaps a topic for another day. I plugged my coax into the radio, plugged in the 12 volt power and was up and running. Over time, that space continued to grow. Looking at it right now, it has two computer monitors, a laptop, three radios, two coax switches, a keyboard, mouse, digital interface, two speakers, and a fan to cool the radio when I'm calling CQ on FT8. I'm not a messy person, but I do like to have my tools convenient. It's not a pristine environment by any stretch, but it's orderly as shacks go. An hour ago, it wasn't. Actually, looking at the clock, that was four hours ago. Time flies when you're having fun. My shack is the centre of my radio activities. I might receive a gadget from a friend to test and I'll put it on my desk ready to go. The same is true for a foot pedal that I found when looking for something else, as is the audio adapter that I used in the desk mixer that I'm experimenting with. Over time, each of these bits and pieces accumulate on the surface. When I noticed that my radio was running hot, or in my mind uncomfortably warm, given that I'm using 5 watts, I decided to invest in a fan, clipped to the edge of the desk, requiring yet another wire. It's not limited to small bits. I'm testing a new radio that comes with removable head, a microphone, cables to join those to the main body, two antenna port cables, a coax switch and a power lead with two cables. Over time you have coax mixed with 12 volt DC and 240 volt AC, audio leads, USB leads, video leads, grounding wire, remote control switches, microphone leads, cat leads and more, all running all over the place. Making a minor change can become a big hassle, making it hard to determine what goes where, not to mention that each cable generates its own little slice of RF, wanted or not. The four hours I've just spent consisted of taking everything except the bolted-on computer monitors off the desk and starting from scratch. I also did this when I first added a second radio, but that was so long ago that the system I implemented then was unrecognisable. Doing it again today, I made better use of the environment and changed some things around. I started with the 240 volts requirements, then the coax, then 12 volts, then audio and finally USB, using cable ties for semi-permanent things like power boards and hook and loop straps for things that move more frequently, like audio wiring and video cables. It's not perfect. I am looking for some flexible coax patch leads. There's USB cables going every which way. The laptop keyboard isn't used, so why use a laptop? No doubt I'll discover more. My point is that this is dynamic, and every now and then it pays to spend a little while putting things back together. My next project is to use an audio mixer to bring all the audio together in one place, so I can use one headset for everything, and give me the opportunity to plug in a tape recorder, as my regulator suggests, for monitoring emergency communications, though I might have to come up with something a little less 1980 for the actual recording. If you're going to do this, move the desk at least a metre from the wall so you can get at the back of your shack. You can thank me later. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Time now for the AMSAT report. Good news this week, we have another satellite turned on for amateur use. CAMSAT CAS-6, or T0108, has a CW beacon on 145.91 MHz, plus a UHF-VHF inverting linear transponder. The downlink is 145.915 to 145.935 MHz, lower sideband, a 20 kHz passband. The uplink is 435.27 to 435.29 MHz, upper sideband. Signals are said to be good. AO91 remains operational, however, please remember to use this satellite only when it is in sunlight. 
In other words, if it's dark at your location, use another satellite. This will help extend the life of the satellite. AMSAT's Golf T has been manifested on NASA's ELANA 46. ELANA stands for Educational Launch of Nano Satellites. A launch date has not been announced on the NASA website. The AMSAT report comes to us each week from Bruce Page, KK5DO. Amateur radio stations in the UK. Europe and US Canada and elsewhere will be celebrating the anniversary of the birth of Guglielmo Marconi and their connection to the wireless pioneer as International Marconi Day stations get on the air on Saturday, April 24th. The annual event is sponsored by the Cornish Radio Amateur Radio Club, operating as GB4IMD. Stations from around the world may contact operators who are on the air at historic Marconi sites using the special call signs to mark the day. In New York, a consortium of amateur radio stations on Long Island will be on the air at such sites as the original Marconi Wireless Telegraph Station in the village of Babylon, where they will operate as K2S. Station K2M will be at the Marconi Tower in Binghamton, New York. In the UK, GB4LD will operate at the site of the old Marconi Hut in Cornwall, and VP8VPC will be operating from the Falkland Islands. Awards are available for shortwave listeners as well as amateur radio operators. For details about the awards and a list of registered Marconi Day stations, visit the website of the Cornish Radio Amateur Radio Club at gx4crc.com. A woman in distress while hiking with a group inside the Great Smoky Mountain National Park was brought to safety late on Sunday night, April 11th, with the help of communications over the W4KEV repeater system in Tennessee. With no cellular service available in the park, hiker Timothy Luttrell, KA9EBJ, used his handy talkie to hit the repeater in Gatlinburg, which was linked to the one in Knoxville, which was being monitored by David Manuel, W5DJR. Timothy told David that a woman in the hiking party had suffered exhaustion and dehydration and needed assistance. David notified emergency medical service as well as a medic who was part of the park search team to help assess her condition via a series of questions. Meanwhile, phone calls were placed to the hiker's family. With questions relayed over the repeater, the medic determined the woman was stable enough to accompany other hikers as they continued slowly down the trail, maintaining contact when possible. Arrangements were made for the hikers to meet with search and rescue officers in a parking area, and ultimately for the woman's safe pickup by her family. Are you a youth coordinator for your club? Do you help run events aimed at youth in ham radio? Do you have any ideas for ways to get more youth into radio? Well, the Irish Radio Transmitter Society Youth Coordinator, Niall Echo India 6 Hotel India Bravo, is putting together a group chat for anyone involved in facilitating youth radio activities in ERA. The purpose of this group is to generate ideas for involving young people and ultimately to show young people how great this hobby is. If you want more information or want to be added to the group chat, you can email Yota, that's Yankee Oscar Tango Alpha, at irts.ie. And in a further youth development announced this week, the IARU Region 1 Youth Working Group are very happy to be cooperating with the Hungarian Amateur Radio Society, the MRASZ, to introduce a new 12-hour contest aimed at younger operators. This year's sessions will be held on Saturdays, the 22nd of May, 08 to 1959 hours UTC, the 17th of July, 10 to 21.59 UTC, and the 30th of December, 12 to 23.59 UTC. More details will be announced later. Time now for the weekly propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that on April 12th, new sunspot group AR2814 appeared following five days of no sunspots. Daily sunspot numbers on the next four days were 16, 16, 17, and 22. Taking the average daily sunspot number for the April 8th through the 14th reporting week from 6.4 last week to 7, the April 15th sunspot number of 22 was not included in this average. So far in 2021, 39% of the days had no sunspots. Geomagnetic indicators were quiet with average daily planetary A indices declining slightly from 6.6 .6 to 5.1, 
Likewise, middle latitude A indices changed from 5.6 to 4.1. On April 14th, spaceweather.com reported a high-speed stream of solar wind from a hole in the sun's southern hemisphere. This could produce a minor geomagnetic storm on April 17th. At 2338 UTC on April 14th, and again at 0239 UTC on April 16th, the Australian Space Forecast Center issued this geomagnetic disturbance warning. Geomagnetic activity is expected to increase to active levels with a chance of an isolated minor storm period from late on April 16th due to a coronal hole effect. The April 16th warning said to expect the efforts to continue through Sunday, April 18th. The predicted solar flux is 74 on April 17th through the 19th, 72 on April 20th and 21st, 70 on April 22nd and 23rd, and 75 on April 24th, all the way to May 8th. The predicted planetary A and dice is 18, 20, and 16 on April 16th through the 18th, 12, 8, 5, and 10 on April 19th through the 22nd, 8 on April 23rd and 24th, 5 on April 25th and 26th, 10 and 8 on April 27th and 28th, and 5 on April 29th through May 3rd. Com Academy, the free annual training conference for emergency communicators, exceeded its geographic boundaries this year and, in doing so, exceeded expectations. This month's two-day conference marked the first time it has been held virtually, allowing for worldwide participation. According to Tim Helming, WT1M, the number of viewers watching live often exceeded 1,400 and never dropped below 950. The format offered pre-recorded presentations with live Q&A afterward. Going online allowed the 20-year-old conference to expand its more traditional regional reach within the Pacific Northwest community out to a worldwide audience. WT1M was quoted as saying, It was a vast amount of work, but we're all really pleased with how it came out. Although organizers hope to return to the in-person format next year, Tim said there is no turning back now on inviting the world to attend once again, and organizers are exploring various options. He said it's clear that there's a big hunger out there for this kind of training and community. The website Inverse has an interesting article on amateur radio direction finding, which is known as ARDF. Radio direction finding has existed for nearly as long as radio itself. The military uses it for practical reasons, utilizing it to triangulate or locate hidden military bases, transmitters and submarines that would otherwise be a secret. The basic technique, with different technological adaptations, was used in both World War I and World War II. And now radio direction finding has become a sport that combines the geeky charm of ham radio, the outdoor skills of orienteering, and the endurance of cross-country. Bob Whiskey Alpha 6 Echo Zulu Victor is an ARDF athlete who has competed since 1999 and has attended four world championships. It's a mental game of hide-and-seek, he said. There's so many parts to it. You're thinking, where am I? Which direction is the transmitter? Hopefully, I don't get lost. Even the best competitors will admit that they do get lost on occasion. But there's something about the sport that keeps competitors coming back year after year. It's the rush of racing, mixed with the pride that comes from knowing that you can trust your brain under pressure. What makes amateur radio direction finding a sport? To really understand ARDF, you need to know the basics of how radios work. Radio transmitters release radio waves that are then picked up by radio receivers with ARDF competitors using portable equipment and antennas. These transmitters and receivers are usually designed to work within a specific set of frequencies. Two of the major ARDF competitions require tracking down transmitters tuned to 3.5 MHz, that's the 80 meter competition, or 144 MHz, the 2 meter competition. Each frequency creates a different flavor of competition, explains Ole Gapestadt, president of the International Amateur Radio Union. He's been presiding over the Amateur Radio Direction Finding World Championships since the first one was organized in the 1980s. The 3.5 MHz competition requires receivers with large antennas. Those are cumbersome to run with, so people get around this by building them out of flexible materials that can move through the brush, like tape measures. They provide steady and accurate signals that make navigating easier. 
The 144 megahertz competition is considered to be the harder challenge. Waves at this frequency don't pass through large objects and instead might be reflected around the forest. Each one of those reflections is about 60 to 70 percent accurate. But following any one signal with too much confidence can lead a competitor down a false trail. And this can even happen to seasoned competitors. Well, you can read the full article at www.inverse.com. As the amateur radio community grows and evolves, the need to better understand the preferences and expectations of amateur radio operators worldwide becomes increasingly important. Inspired by the new licensees joining amateur radio's ranks and the seasoned ones who continue to believe in its value, hamcensus.org is inviting all hams to take part in a unique survey. The project's founders are looking forward to responses from both the United States and the rest of the globe, notably from Canadian neighbors to the north, the large Japanese and Thai communities, and all other operators worldwide. Questions deal with operating preferences, gear, the shack, views on regulations, clubs and associations, and, importantly, about the future of amateur radio. K3MRI, co-admin of both HAM Census and HAM Community, says, We wanted to give operators a louder voice to better inform club leaders, associations, manufacturers, and also regulators. He continues, We all want the amateur radio community to grow organically and collaboratively, and for that we need to know what operators are thinking. K3MRI and his team are counting on operators, clubs, organizations, and even ham-related businesses to spread the word, ensuring there is a large sample of respondents of all ages, all interests, and all nationalities. Ham Census, which is divided into six parts, runs year-round, delivering constantly updated results. The only caveat is that, though it is absolutely free for all to take and use, only those who complete all six parts of the census have access to the full results. Importantly, after completing it, Ham Census is encouraging respondents to submit suggestions on how to improve both the questions and multiple choice answers, notably on everything that is cutting edge. As K3MRI states, if there's one thing all hams continue to prove, is that amateur radio innovation is alive and well. Ham Census takes about 40 to 45 minutes to complete. An article on the Airline Ratings website says that the fascinating technology known as Weak Signal Propagation, WSPR, known as WISPR in amateur radio parlance, which is a digital communications protocol, is providing a new tool to help confirm the location of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370, which disappeared just over seven years ago with 239 souls on board. As an analogy, imagine you had to hike across a prairie and every two minutes there were a bunch of tripwires that you couldn't see that set off an alarm. Or, to put it another way, imagine you broke into a high security bank and to reach the vault you had to cross a room full of laser beams that you couldn't see. But any interruption of a laser beam would set off an alarm. Well, that's what aircraft do. They trip off invisible radio waves. And Richard Godfrey, one of the leading experts in the hunt for MH370, has just concluded a new study which finds that the aircraft tripped off a series of radio transmission detections which confirm that it is in the location that satellite studies and drift modelling have suggested. You can read the full story at www.airlineratings.com and there's a presentation called Geocaching in the Ionosphere by Dr. Robert Westphal, Delta Juliet 4, Foxtrot, Foxtrot, which was given at the Ham SCI Workshop 2021. This gave an overview of the use of the Weak Signal Propagation Reporting Network in the search for MH370. If you want to download the slides from this presentation, there's a Dropbox link under this story on the Southgate Amateur Radio News website, www.southgatearc.org. A five-year and $9.3 million National Science Foundation grant will allow the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute to establish a new research observatory. 
at the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. With more on this story, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. A former military facility, HARP is now operated by UAF and is home to HARP Amateur Radio Club's KL7ERP. The new Subaural Geophysical Observatory for Space Physics and Radio Science will be dedicated to exploring Earth's upper atmosphere and geospace environment. The research grant will allow scientists to investigate how the sun affects Earth's ionosphere and magnetosphere to produce changes in space weather. Their work will help fill gaps in knowledge about the region, which is important because ionospheric disturbances, if severe enough, can disrupt communication systems and damage the power grid. HARP Research Station Chief Engineer Steve Floyd, W4YHD, told ARRL that amateur radio will clearly benefit from the upgrade through an improved understanding of ionospheric propagation and space weather physics and better HF propagation prediction modeling data. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The facility's 33-acre ionospheric research instrument will be the centerpiece of the observatory. This National Science Foundation support will provide the scientific community increased access to the instruments at the observatory and hopefully grow the scientific community, said Geophysical Institute Director Robert McCoy, the project's principal investigator. A second National Science Foundation funded project will add a light detection and ranging instrument to the site, which will allow the study of other regions of the upper atmosphere. A LIDAR sends pulses of laser light to determine the composition, temperature, and structure of the regions of the upper atmosphere from 90 to 150 kilometers. University of Alaska Fairbanks hopes to add additional instruments over time at the Gakona, Alaska research site. Research at the observatory is initially expected to include the study of various types of aurora and other occurrences in the ionosphere, which stretches from about 50 to 400 miles above the Earth's surface. The Gakona facility is a prime location for the study of the ionosphere and magnetosphere because of its location in relation to one of the Earth's magnetic field lines that reaches deep into the magnetosphere. The, that's the magnetic field that shields the planet from much of the sun's plasma energy. Amateur radio will clearly benefit with an improved understanding of ionospheric propagation and space weather physics and provided improved HF propagation prediction modeling data. HARP Research Station Chief Engineer and ARRL Life member Steve Floyd, W4YHD, told ARRL. He said radio science experiments will also provide valuable data set to encourage development of new radio technologies and modulation methods useful from VLF through HF. Floyd is the KL7ERP trustee, which he says is available to demonstrate amateur radio to visiting scientists and students, and to maintain contact with Alaska hams, and to provide visiting hams with an opportunity to operate from this unique Alaska location. For more than 25 years, University of Alaska Fairbanks, the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency have collaborated on ionospheric research. As Air Force funding for research and development decreased, the Air Force transferred the research equipment to the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Under an education partnership agreement, the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute operates a facility under an agreement with the Air Force. The Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens in San Marino, California, has recently acquired an archive of papers and correspondence to, from, and about wireless pioneer and Nobel laureate Guglielmo Marconi. With more on this story, we go to League Headquarters, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this special report. Among the more than 200 pages of correspondence are 31 letters from Marconi to his chief engineer, Richard Vivian, written between 1902 and 1909 regarding the construction and successful implementation of a transatlantic wireless telegraph system. Marconi was relentless in his attempts to improve on his radio work, as reflected in this archive. Here's a snippet from Marconi to his chief engineer in 1907. 
working very hard to try and find out what are the somewhat occult causes which make signals good one night and unobtainable the next. I believe I have found, if not very clearly, the cause of the effects noticed. The occult? Is that what it is? Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. The collection also includes Vivian's extensive manuscript, Overview of Wireless Technology, Notes on Log Distance Wireless Telegraphy, and the Design and Construction and Working of High Power Wireless Stations, which were all written between 1900 and 1904. Marconi transformed the speed and effectiveness of telecommunication through wireless telegraphy, said Daniel Lewis, who was responsible for the Huntington History of Science and Technology holdings from 1800 to the present. Vivian was largely responsible for the construction and operation of the transmitting station at Poldhu in Cornwall, from where the first ever transatlantic signal was sent to Newfoundland on December 12, 1901. He was also in charge of the Cape Britain station the following year when the first signal was sent in the opposite direction and a regular transatlantic telegraphy service was established. The Huntington Collection of Telegraph Holdings is one of the most significant in the United States. It began with a 2002 donation of several boxes of correspondence to and from Marconi. Rainer Engelet, Delta Foxtrot 2 November uniform from the German National Amateur Radio Society, the DARC, reports that, at the suggestion of the Bavarian Prime Minister, Dr. Markus Söder, the Federal President has awarded the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany to the well-known professor, entrepreneur and radio amateur, Professor Doctor of Engineering Ulrich Roder, Delta Juliet II, Lima Romeo. With this award, the Federal President honoured the great achievements of DJ2LR in the fields of high frequency and microwave technology. Dr. Roder is also considered to be the inventor of SDR technology, which he first presented at a conference in 1985. SDR stands for Software Defined Radio. In recognition of this pioneering development, which is used today in practically all communication technology and also in amateur radio, a special call sign, Delta Lima 35 Sierra Delta Romeo, was aired last year. DJ2LR is a co-partner of a Munich-based company involved in high-frequency and measurement technology, and he celebrated his 80th birthday last year. He is, of course, a member of the DARC. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower, like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel, usually built from a three-quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across, maybe a quarter inch thick. Material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop. You will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower, legs, and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building. If you do not have access to a welder, have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe, with about a, a foot between the straps, which would be centered on the three-foot pipe. This will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna. Pre-drill the holes for U-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs. Then also do the same for the U-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube. This mount should be set across one entire face of the tower so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower. If done properly, would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna 
to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for 6 meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur sized coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to 5 inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape and coax can change size and length during the day so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. After 27 years, the Japan Amateur Radio League is returning to growth. The number of members of the Japan Amateur Radio League has increased from the previous year for the first time in 27 years. The league has been actively engaged in membership development activities to strengthen its organizational foundation, promote membership development plans by regional headquarters and branches, continuation of various campaigns for new members and current members, strengthening of cooperation with related organizations and companies, and active public relations of amateur radio and JARL activities. However, these measures have steadily come to fruition, and despite the cancellation or postponement of various events, such as the ham fair due to the corona disaster, the gradual decrease in the number of members has definitely improved. The number of members at the end of the fiscal year was 65,788, an increase of 574 from the same period of the previous year. As of the end of the fiscal year, the number of members has increased year on year for the first time in 27 years since 1994. We would like to express our gratitude to all members and other concerned parties for their cooperation. Unfortunately, the number of amateur radio stations as a whole continues to decline. But with the recent revision of the system, we will work harder to promote amateur radio, and as many people as possible will be members of the Federation. It is of the utmost importance that you play an active role, and we will continue to improve the satisfaction of our members and further enhance our membership services to manage the Federation. Over 15 months ago, in its 2020 New Year statement, JARL President Yoshinori Takeo, JG1KTC, said the league would continue to focus on acquiring new members among the younger generation and women. This approach seems to be paying off. Here is a listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, which is a members-only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, visit the Learning Network web page. Finding and Fixing RFI Hosted by Paul Chunchiello, W1VLF will take place on Tuesday, April 20th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. 
Radio frequency interference has been a problem for ham radio operators and shortwave listeners since the radio hobby began. Noise has gotten worse over the last 20 years or so with the advent of widespread solar power, LED lighting, grow lights, and digital devices. Learn all about finding and fixing RFI in today's world. HF Noise Mitigation, hosted by ARRL Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO, will take place on Thursday, May 6th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern or 1930 UTC. An educational seminar to help both new and experienced HF operators who find themselves plagued with noise. We'll learn what noise is, discuss the various noise sources, and talk about how to mitigate those noises using a variety of techniques. W1AW Antenna Farm, hosted by W1AW Station Manager Joe Garcia and J1Q, will take place on Tuesday, May 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1700 UTC. Experience a bird's eye view and description of the antennas used by W1AW for the station's scheduled transmissions and visiting operator activity. All the antennas used at W1AW are single band Yagis. Viewers will also see the 5 GHz sector antennas that are part of W1AW's Arden system. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL learning network schedule is subject to change. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, x-ray bravo sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use anchor audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if this week in amateur radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, Researcher and innovator Ulrich Rode, N1UL, has been awarded the Cross of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. He was nominated by Marcus Schurter, President of the German State of Bavaria and member of the Bavarian Parliament. Schurter said that Rode's work as a scientist, university lecturer, developer, and entrepreneur in the fields of radio frequency and microwave technology has made a significant contribution to our country's technological advances, prosperity, and security. The Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, also known as the Federal Cross of Merit, is the highest tribute the Federal Republic of Germany can pay to individuals for services to the nation. Federal President Theodore Heuss established the order in 1951, on the second anniversary of the founding of the Federal Republic. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 
at gmail.com. That address once again is W2XBS77 at gmail.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.